Canada has long held a quiet paradox in its rail identity, a vast country demanding fast and modern trains yet perpetually hampered by a system that's only just too slow. Past attempts like the turbo train in the 1970s flashed with promise only to fade away, leaving decades of what-ifs and a feeling of never being completed. And now with the federal government announcing the Alto Project, Canada's first true high-speed rail line, the story takes a new turn. When was the project announced? How many months have passed? What's the current status and are there any updates? All of that and the surprising story behind it will be revealed in today's episode of On the Trains. Before diving into the progress, let's take a look at the history of this project. Historical Background Canada's pursuit of high-speed rail is a saga that stretches back generations, a story of bold ideas repeatedly slowed, stalled, and shelved. It begins in the mid-20th century with a train that looked like it might change everything, the turbo train. Introduced in the late 1960s, it was Canada's first taste of truly fast rail. In U.S. tests, it hit 170 miles per hour on Canadian soil, though it never broke 140 miles per hour. The reason was painfully simple, the infrastructure wasn't built for it. The turbo had to share tracks with lumbering freight trains, turning every promising journey into a gauntlet of delays. And it wasn't just the schedule that suffered. Passengers complained about deafening noise and jolting movements and the media tore into it with merciless criticism. Fourteen troubled years later in 1982, the turbo train was retired with no successor in sight. That moment cast a long shadow. What followed wasn't progress but paralysis. Through the 1980s, 1990s, and early 2000s, Canada entered what became known as the research era wave after wave of official reports praising high-speed rail's economic benefits, climate advantages and potential to transform daily life. But each study eventually met the same fate. Political enthusiasm waned, funding evaporated and the vision faded. By 2003, Canada stood alone as the only G7 nation without a single high-speed rail line. France raced ahead with the TGV. Japan refined its flawless Shinkansen. China built the world's largest high-speed rail network. Even the United States, often mocked for its rail shortcomings, launched a Sela outperforming anything running north of the border. Occasional regional proposals sparked hope only to fall into the same trap. The 2021 Prairie Link plan to connect Calgary and Edmonton briefly electrified the conversation, but soon came the familiar obstacles. No money-shaky political backing, endless feasibility reviews. By 2022, attention shifted back to the Quebec City-Windsor corridor, home to nearly half of Canada's population. Yet by 2025, still nothing had materialized. Another idea added to the National Archive of Unrealized Potential. But then something changed. What began as quiet signals of federal interest suddenly crystallized into action. On February 19, 2025, in Montreal, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau unveiled something unprecedented. Alto, a new state-run corporation created to finally deliver high-speed rail. What began as VR Rail's high-frequency rail concept was swiftly retooled, upgraded, and rebranded into a true high-speed vision. Alto's mandate is striking build a 1,000-kilometer corridor on dedicated tracks entirely free from freight interference and push operating speeds to nearly twice VR Rail's current 100 miles per hour limit. Central to this push was an unusually rigorous international bidding competition culminating in the selection of the Cadence Consortium, a team blending global expertise with strong Canadian roots. The lineup reads like a who's who of successful rail development CDPQ Infra with its deep financial backing from Quebec's pension fund. Atkins Realis, formerly SNC-Lavalin, Keolis for operations, SYSTRA for engineering, Air Canada for travel coordination, and SNCF Voyageurs, the French operator behind the iconic TGV. These players bring experience from proven megaprojects like Vancouver's Skytrain Canada Line and Montreal's REM. For the first time in decades, Canada's high-speed rail ambitions no longer look like another research paper gathering dust. They look like a real structure with real partners and a real shot at finally closing the gap with the rest of the world. Having reviewed that historical context, what has actually happened since Alto was announced, Let's move on to the next section. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel for updates on U.S. and World Railroad news. Current progress and milestones. Since its inception, Alto has moved with an uncharacteristically focused rhythm, 
turning what once felt like abstract ambition into a sequence of concrete actions. The momentum began almost immediately after the announcement marked by the March 21, 2025 signing of the development agreement between Alto and Cadence. That moment formalized their partnership on route planning engineering frameworks and early community input. Just 10 days later, on March 31st, the co-development phase opened launching detailed corridor refinement and preliminary on-the-ground evaluations. A defining milestone arrived on May 30, 2025. For the first time, technical specifications were laid out in depth, highlighting innovations required to sustain 300 km per hour travel, advanced track engineering to suppress vibration structural designs for stability and performance standards that reflect a genuine high-speed ethos. Community engagement accelerated soon after. At the first public meeting on August 28, 2025, CEO Martin Imblot framed the project as a new chapter in Canadian transit, inviting corridor residents to shape decisions that will affect generations. National recognition followed. On September 14, 2025, Alto was officially designated a nation-building initiative and folded under the Major Projects Office, a federal body tasked with shepherding transformative infrastructure. The designation promised smoother approvals without sacrificing environmental scrutiny. Then came the November 2025 federal budget under Prime Minister Mark Carney, which compressed the preparatory timeline from eight years to four, aiming squarely at a 2029 construction launch. Legislative adjustments soon followed. Rules modernized regulatory pathways, simplified land procurement strengthened. Industry partnerships also deepened. On November 24, 2025, Alto convened discussions with Canadian steel producers to secure massive volumes, hundreds of thousands of tons for rails and structural components, in line with strict by Canadian requirements. The approach strengthens domestic manufacturing while safeguarding long-term supply chains. By December 4, 2025, core contracts were executed clearing the way for intensive design work, environmental studies and corridor optimization. Operationally, Alto's blueprint centers on a fully electrified passenger-only network designed to eliminate freight interference altogether. Its seven-station spine, Toronto, Peterborough, Ottawa, Montreal, Laval, Trois-Rivières, and Quebec City, is structured to knit together the corridor's major urban anchors. Integration with existing systems such as VR Rail's 22 Siemens Venture Trains, delivered in late 2024, offers a bridge toward the future network. Ridership forecasts draw on the corridor's 2024 figure of 4.2 million passengers, an improvement from pandemic lows but still shy of 2019's 4.8 million, with recent reliability issues underscoring the need for a rebuilt system. And if current progress holds, the project is on track for a full operational launch around 2043. So how much will the project cost and what benefits could it bring to Canada? Costs and Economic Impacts among all the dimensions of the Alto project, its costs and economic impacts remain some of the most compelling and elusive elements. Throughout public hearings and community forums, Alto's leadership has consistently refrained from offering concrete price tags or definitive construction timelines. It is an unusual stance for a project entering such a formative phase, yet one largely explained by the fact that environmental reviews and engineering studies are still underway. Even so, the sheer scope of what is planned points unmistakably to a mega-project. Alto's own comparison of the project to the St. Lawrence Waterway underscores just how transformative and costly this national undertaking is expected to be. Despite the lack of published financial figures, the projected economic benefits have been communicated with much greater clarity. The high-speed rail corridor is designed to strengthen links between Canada's most essential urban centres, Toronto, Ottawa, Montreal, and Quebec City, while integrating key regional hubs such as Peterborough and Trois-Rivières. This level of connectivity has the potential to reshape business networks, energize tourism, and reduce long-standing barriers to labor mobility. It also offers relief to a corridor where highways and air routes are already running beyond comfortable capacity. Electrification adds another layer of strategic value, promising significant emissions reductions, and helping Canada advance toward its climate goals, especially as high-speed rail can replace a notable share of short-distance flights and fossil-fuel-based car travel. Industrial strategy is woven directly into the project's design. Alto has been actively courting domestic manufacturers, particularly Canadian steel producers, with the aim of turning the high-speed rail build-out 
into a catalyst for expanding national production and securing more resilient supply chains. And beyond economics, the cultural and social returns are substantial better access to education services and tourism, new opportunities for communities along the line, and a corridor more tightly integrated than ever before. But with such ambitious goals, what challenges might stand in the way? Challenges. One of the most prominent uncertainties is the absence of concrete cost estimates and construction timelines, an information gap that makes it difficult for both the public and policymakers to properly evaluate feasibility or long-term impact. Alto maintains that these figures can only be finalized after expert studies conclude, yet the current ambiguity inevitably raises questions about the project's financing model and its durability across multiple political cycles. Added to this is the immense technical complexity of the undertaking nearly 1,000 kilometers of fully electrified high-speed track will require navigating varied terrain, resolving land acquisition issues, designing grade separations, constructing new stations, and building a modern maintenance ecosystem all in a country with relatively limited experience delivering large-scale passenger rail megaprojects. Another layer of uncertainty comes from station placement, especially in Toronto. Alto's choice not to prioritize Union Station Canada's busiest rail hub and a symbolic anchor of the national network has prompted concerns around connectivity and public acceptance, particularly in the absence of a clear rationale. At the institutional level, Alto itself is still in its infancy and must rapidly develop the internal capacity required for a project of this magnitude. That includes recruiting expertise in engineering procurement, environmental assessment, long-term planning, and community engagement, all of which are essential yet challenging to assemble at speed. Public skepticism also looms large after decades of abandoned studies and stalled proposals. Many Canadians insist they will only believe in the project once physical construction begins. Complicating matters further is the need for coordinated governance across multiple provinces, municipalities, indigenous nations, and federal agencies. Working in tandem with entities such as Metrolink's local governments and community organizations requires reconciling a wide array of priorities, some aligned others competing. And underpinning all of these considerations is perhaps the project's most fundamental challenge, striking the right balance between ambition and realism, ensuring that the drive to modernize national transportation does not exceed Canada's political resolve, fiscal bandwidth, or technical capacity. In short, the road ahead will be challenging and success is far from guaranteed, but for the first time, things are set. Whether Alto will be a breakthrough or another unfulfilled promise will depend on what happens next, and Canada is now closer than ever to answering that question. That's all for today. See you.